we're smart people and we're all passionate about what we do. And um, we think the world expects us to have the, the, the answer on the spot, you know? And being able to say, I don't know, let me think about it. So I think early in my career, I was terrified of, of saying that. Like, I have to have the right answer all the time. But actually, you're so much more credible when you're saying, like, I, I don't know. And, you know, if I don't know, I'm not going to try to make it up. You know, I think any time that uh, you know, I'm around a team, you know, working with other people and just being able to, um, um, you know, bow to their expertise and say, all right, well, you're brilliant. This is why I hired you. Tell me what to do. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. I had been the president of my homeowners association and I've been on the board of directors for many years and it changed my walk through the neighborhood. No longer was it just like, Hey, how you doing? Talk about sports, the weather, whatever. It became people coming up to me with, I've got an idea, Daniel, we should do this. Oh, we should have this Daniel. This should change Daniel. And I'd always say, great, make it happen. We're an all volunteer organization. If you want it to happen, make it happen. The conversion rate on that was eh, maybe 2% if I'm lucky. But now I'm talking about a homeowners association, marketing organizations, businesses, they're the same. Everyone's got ideas, but few have the tenacity and fortitude to make them happen, which is why I love the lesson from a recent podcast guest application. Ideas are easy. Making is the hard part. Here to share the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is John Reed, the CMO of AI Identified. Thanks for joining us, John. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's take a quick look at your background, cherry picking some places you've been here so people understand who I'm talking to you. You've been a copywriter at Hill Holiday and Publicist Seattle, senior copywriter at Kramer Gersalt, associate creative director at Crispin Porter and Bogusky, chief creative officer at Evolution Bureau, head of brand and co-founder at Consortium 9, founder of Illuminator, and for the past seven months, CMO at AI Identified. AI Identified has raised $10 million in Series A financing for its artificial intelligence-based platform, and they have doubled their revenue in each of the past two years. The company has 40 employees, and five of them report to John. So, John, give us a sense. Your journey, you were a fractional CMO. Now mm -hmm. you're the full-on CMO. Fractional CMO, we haven't had anyone on the, the podcast on how I made it marketing that's had that role before. I have never personally worked with someone, but I've been hearing this term a lot. So give us a sense, what was that like? And then what is your day like today? Sure, yeah. So the, the fractional thing came on um, <clears throat> as a result of just business was so slow and I started freelancing again. Um, and then in addition to doing all the creative work, I was helping out some friends who had their own brands. And just, I love talking shop. So just kind of issuing advice and, you know, sitting there over coffee and, you know, one, one of my, uh, one of my friends, um, had this, this tech company and they needed like a lot of marketing help. And we just kept talking and talking. And, you know, eventually I just given them so advice, so much advice. It's like, Hey, you could, you should come in as like a, you know, part-time basis and just start helping us. And, and then I did, you know, and so I was doing that with, um, you know, a bunch of other projects uh, over the course of last year. And then on the fractional basis, I like to say the the fraction quickly became one over one. And I wasn't having a ton of uh, a ton of time to do other things. I didn't really want to do other things. And so then they pulled me in, you know, full time at the beginning of this year. You know, it's funny. I'm not a biz dev guy. I'm, I'm not good at that at all. But how many freaking LinkedIn messages do you get a day of like someone trying to do business? That I know you said you were just trying to help someone out. That's the best business development ever. And look at that. That turns into this role. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's a just that's a great lesson right there for everyone. Like maybe start by helping people out instead of spamming sure, them on LinkedIn. There you go. I mean, that's that is that's exactly it. That is that's what we do for sure. You know, I like to say just I'm here to help. Um to answer that, to, to answer your rhetorical question, I get all of LinkedIn <laughs> messages and, you know, and I've, and I've sent, you know, a million of those as well, you know, and um, I try to actually get back to as many of them as possible. This is a big deal for me. So 
if it's not just a um, you know someone launching a seven thousand sales emails, you know, I, I do try to get back to people and like because you've had that experience of like just like you know launching a million emails into the abyss is just it's uh, it's soul crushing. So you know, knowing someone else is out there, I think is um, you know it's just something we can do for people. You know, it's funny you say that because I reply to everyone, 100% of them. It's a, it's a form letter. It's basically, here's what we're looking for, right? Because a marketing Sherpa, we're looking to publish case studies. We're, we're looking for podcast guests. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're looking to help other marketers. Those people should know that. Um, yeah. But I do. I do re- reply to 100% of them because like you said, hey, at least, and, and then that, there's their opportunity. So are they going to drop the sales spiel and see like, oh, here's an opportunity to help other people through case studies and, and we can, maybe we can start working together mm-hmm. or is there, are they going to keep pushing? Now, yeah. 80 or 90% of them keep pushing and just, here's right. my calumny. Let's, right. <laughs> I need, I need to book so, how many conversations this quarter, but, um, right. you know, yep. a few of them, you, you find some good uh, relationships. I didn't think you would. For sure. Um, all right. With that, let's jump into mm-hmm. some lessons from your career, lessons from some of the things you made. Uh, I like to say I've never worked in any other career, never been a podiatrist or an actuary or anything, but I feel <laughs> like marketing is kind of special because we get to make things. Mm. And so let's take a look at some lessons from the things you made. The first lesson you say, the key to turning great ideas into successful campaigns, you need a door kicker like Hannah. Hannah. So uh, Hannah. tell us who's Hannah. Yeah, I'm Hannah Granger. Up well. I'm going to say yeah. Hannah Granger's name a lot um, because people should hire Hannah Granger because she's she's fantastic. It's, um, so she was um, one of the marketers inside Jameson when we were working together. Uh, we worked on the uh, digital and social part of their business. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I just started as the CCO at Evolution Bureau and uh, one of the creatives had a a video he was doing that basically turned a bottle of Jameson into a spaceship, you know, and I think that'll, that'll be a cute video for sure, but let's just do it. Let's just do it for real, you know, and everyone was like, ah, we keep, how are you going to do that? And I'm like, no, we'll just, let's just try, right? Um, and, you know, inside of two weeks, we got that, we got that entire thing done. And so here's... You know, some of the keys to that was like one, you know, doing these things, having a plan and doing it in a really disciplined way. So, you know, the client doesn't see it as like, uh, you know, just a bunch of cowboys trying to, you know, do whatever they want. And then, yeah, you need you need a rabbi, you need someone inside, you need a, an advocate. And, uh, you know, that for us, that was that was Hannah, you know, and I think that, um, you know, that like get it doneness, you know, I think is so valuable and I think you see that a lot on the agency side and to find it on brand side, I think is, is really special. Um, I like to say that the Kool-Aid man is my spirit animal, you know? And so it's like trying to bust through, uh, you know, any challenges that pop up along the way is, is really important because they happen. But um, I heard another one of your, your episodes, like you're never going to do great work if, uh, if your, your client isn't as ambitious as you. And I think that's just like, that's like such a great quote because it's it's so spot on. So you just burst into a conference room, you go, "Oh yeah," and then you make sure <laughs> is that. Uh, so but I don't want we we kind of fast forward over this, but I want the audience to understand exactly what you did with when you say, "Hey, we did it. We had this idea. We went to you actually launched a bottle into space from the UK." Is that right? Or that's that is correct. Yeah, I probably should have actually talked about the project. So. Uh, you know, what it, what it was is um, it was an April Fool's project, which is like a bigger holiday for Jameson than St. Patrick's Day even. Um, and we launched a new product called Jameson Space Age. And uh, the great thing about having Hannah on the brand side was she was able to to pull in basically like all the different disciplines inside of Jameson. So down to we treated it like a real product launch and it was on their site and it was listed as sold out, right? Cause it was so popular, you know, but just being able to, to create that level of, of realness around the, the project just made it, you know, so PRable, um, which, which is huge. And like, yeah, the um, producer who was originally going to make this little video and I'm like, all right, cool. Like find someone who can launch this thing into space. And, and she's like, well, you know, I found someone, but they're in Manchester, England. I'm like, cool. She's like, well, I, I have to go to England t- tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so she's like, then she did, right? And then just, hey, you know, my one of my big things is like, we can definitely do this. You know, at that time, there was 
a little go-kart driving around the surface of Mars, sending us selfies, you know? So in comparison to that, I think our, you know, our dumb advertising idea is going to be like pretty doable, you know? So given uh, a little bit of time and a little bit of money, I think we could make pretty much anything happen. Well, you made to come to life that saying, well, if they could put on the man on the moon, we can do this, right? Uh, right. So you mentioned uh, Alex Ricard of Pernod, Pernod Ricard fame. You said uh, that he said it was his favorite project of any of his brands did that year. And I wanted to ask you about Alex Ricard and Pernod Ricard, uh, Alexandra Ricard, mm. um, and what you learned. Like, what did you learn seeing the inner workings of that organization up close? Because to me, it's, it's a pretty organ- interesting organization, him specifically. You go to his Instagram, he says, it's not business, it's passion. He says, humbled by what we create conviviality, right? You get this idea and it's, you know, a, a spirits brand. It's all about, oh, branding and, you know, fun and stuff. But then when you look at the guy himself, uh, you know, it is a family business, but he didn't just jump right into the family business. Wharton, right. Accenture, Morgan Stanley, he did m a Like, this is the guy who knew business. So what did you learn working up close with an organization like this? High business acumen, but again, the thing that we need so much in marketing, the ability to create this fun brand around the product. Sure, yeah. Well, I didn't work with him directly you know, at, at all. And I worked with him, um, I would say that I, I worked with him culturally because everything that you see about him online or anything that he that he talks about is like really well represented inside of uh, the, the um, um, Jameson organization. So, you know, they own a lot of spirits brands and you know, I've had the chance to work on a few of them. Um, and there's that sense of like the importance of conviviality and just like, just taking seriously what we do and you know, what they do, what their brands uh, role in people's lives are like that really comes through across the board. So I think it's really impressive. Just someone, especially inside of a family business uh, who's, uh, really, really kept that nailed down and really uh, championed what their what their uh, brand and cultures are all about. And you talk about, I mean, this is the Jameson story, great example of what it takes to get a very, very creative idea, uh, you know, done in a major brand. But what about in B2B brands? Like, do you have any mm-hmm. examples of that? Like what it takes in B2B brands? Because when I heard this story, I can always kind of hear my um, professor from my portfolio class back in college. And she'd say like, I don't want to see Porsche and Harley in your portfolio. You know, a lot of people can do great work for Porsche and Harley, find a boring company and do great work, do it for a bank or something like that. And, and it could be hard for B2B. And so for me, and I want to hear kind of your, your thoughts on this too, for B2B, I, I do think the one upside is you can get closer to the customer and you can use that when you're trying to pitch ideas. And, and I remember talking to Christian Javago, who's a real advocate for interviewing customers. And mm-hmm. she would say political power comes from understanding the buyer's funnel. So mm-hmm. do you have any examples or experience with that, John, B2B brands? Like it's hard to do good work for creative B2C brands, but man, B2B brands, it could be even that much harder. Well, I think you're spot on, you know, when, when, you know, working on, Jameson or Burger King or, you know, brand, brands like that is like, that's terrifying. Cause if you're not hitting it out of the park, you know, it's like, why even bother? Right. Um, so I love like working on boring stuff. You know, I've got a project I love in my portfolio and I, from, you know, about like this, like dog food, you know, I think stuff like that is like, well, you know, I love brands who can't really afford to be boring. So working in the Bay Area, it's it's basically impossible to work in in marketing and advertising in the Bay Area without touching a lot of the the B two B tech brands, right? So I've had a chance to work on Microsoft's B two B side and um, uh, Intel and and um, HP and and Dell, you know. So it's really like everything, and I'll I'll beat this drum um, till everyone is bored of listening to me. But it's just it's just the people, you know. And so there is no B to B. There's no B. It's just a person who buys that. You know, it's a person with a problem who needs a solution, who then just has to walk it through an, an organization. You know, but it it's just not as different as people want to make it. You know, just in, in my experience, um, and like to that. I don't know. It's like on the the client side, you know, it's just like the same as anything else. If you've got someone who's going to champion a great idea um, and you have that level of trust, then you can make great things happen, you know? And if uh, the, the, I think the one thing that happens a lot in the um, uh, marketing B2B space, it's like, you know, you have a lot of like really established brands and 
you know, those are, those are brands where um, they can afford to be boring, you know? Um, and those are typically more difficult brands to work with, you know? So the best work that I've done, especially, you know, even in the B2B space, you know, is, um, you know, challenger brands, brands that have something to prove, um, even, you know, like working with like the team at Dell was fantastic because they were really ambitious and they knew that they could not afford to be boring, you know, and the work we made for them was, was really interesting and fun and, and did really well for them. That, that's a really good point about the challenger brands. And, you know, it's that famous Avis, we're number two, we try harder, right? And mm-hmm. one thing I learned in my career, especially as a younger writer, it's even within an agency, sometimes take the dog projects, right? Like I remember one of the favorite campaigns I created was a stupid, it was a uh, for realtors in like a realtor newspaper. And it was like their spiff campaign where every other campaign was just a bunch of dollar bills thrown up there. And no one in the agency wanted to take us because it, I mean, it's, it's stung. No one wanted to do it, but it, it gave me a chance to do something at least mildly creative. I was able to change it from all about dollar bills and made this thank you campaign. Cause I was kind of young buying a house mm-hmm. and I saw what realtors do and like, Hey, thank you for missing dinner with your family to take, you know, these new customers through the house. And it, it resonated with the realtors and like, it was a fun thing to do. Mm-hmm. And because, but really I only took that cause like nobody else wanted to do it in the agency, you know, for, for sure. You know, I, and I think that's, that's really telling, like I, I you know, I, I want to hire that person all, all the time. That's been kind of a, a, I don't know, maybe like a hallmark of my career. It's certainly what I would say like launched my career um, to whatever success you could say I've, I've had was, um, and I remember when I was at Kramer Crassel and we're working on this like Super Bowl um, uh, campaign. And, uh, you know, so everyone is writing like a zillion scripts and tensions high and nobody wants to do the nobody wants to do the website part of it, you know. And, you know, it was like this like classic thing. And I'm, you know, feel bad bringing up something that's like 15 or whatever years old, but. We made this thing called monkey mail and it was like basically, you know, long story short, you could basically make this like monkey character swear, you know, it's just <laughs> talk with your voice, which meant people made it swear. Um, and it was, uh, uh, crazy popular, you know, like getting, I think it was my first experience getting to watch something, um, kind of catch on in culture, you know? And I think, um, the idea of, of something going viral and virality was, uh, like, Oh, and that is like, that is like such a high, you know, that's such, so interesting to me. Um, and, you know, talk about making stuff, like getting to see something that you made um, and, and millions of people are, are engaging with it. Like that's being able to like see that versus just like, you know, you know, people are watching your TV commercial because you made them, you know, I think is uh, that's something that I just like really, really gets me excited about what we do. I love that. That was one of the exciting things for me from going from print to digital. Like print was a lot harder to get a sense of how you know people are interacting around your stuff. Right. Um, but to do great work, you also mentioned if you don't hold the line, you won't mm-hmm. create great marketing. So how do you hold the line, John? Or maybe how have you not in the past? Oh man, this is like such a thing, you know. Um, well, it gets back to having an advocate inside the brand, you know, someone and they're gonna hold a line. Because a lot of the times you'll have this like great project and this is how it's structured da, 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 and then it's like, well, the CEO doesn't want to do this part of it. And then, um, you know, and then it's kind of like you've declawed it or you've made the idea not quite work. You know, for for me, the times where I have not held the line, because I'm, I'm a, you know, I think I'm kind of a weaponized optimist. I'm like, cool, we'll just make it good anyway, you know? And that's like really helped me a lot in my career. It's also been detrimental. You know, I had one one project where there was like this, just one part of it where we had to like issue out like, you know, rewards and coupons and stuff to keep people engaged and going with it. And the client like really late in the project was like, well, we're not going to do that part. And I'm like, all right, well, what's, I don't want to, you know, I wanted to keep doing it. So, you know, we did and it was like, it was fine. It worked, but it was not as, uh, it wasn't as exciting. It didn't do what I, what I really knew it could have done, you know? And anytime that like, um, anytime someone, you know, wants to chip away at a key component, you have to be brave enough to walk that idea out back and put it down. You know, I say like our, our superpower as, you know, creative marketers is, we can always have new ideas, 
you know, I can have more ideas than you can kill. Like you will be exhausted at killing ideas or tell me why they don't work. And I will keep coming back with more great ideas. It's something that I tell, you know, uh, all everyone who's ever worked for me, you know, is something that I impress upon them. It's like creativity is, is great. There's a lot of creative people out there. There's everyone's got an idea. Like this is about resilience, you know, and being able to come back when, uh, you know, when, when there's some reason why something doesn't work, you know, thinking it through and being able to come back with another solution. Like that's, that's the job. Yeah. You know, I was reading an article in Time Magazine this morning about The Sopranos. It's the 25th mm-hmm. anniversary. And one of the things they said that made that show so great was uh, David Chase, the creator, HBO would write checks for whatever he wanted. And there were no notes. There were no yep. notes from like the, the, yep. <laughs> the industry executives. Yep. And I thought, yep. man, that is an ideal client. Yeah. But but John, most of us don't have that client. So right. I want to ask you what communication strategy has been effective for you when working with stakeholders to make sure you can hold that line, right? Yep. So for example, I know you talk about sometimes there's a point to uh, kill the idea, but sometimes too, we just need to communicate that idea, that value proposition effectively, you know, sell it internally. Mm-hmm. And for example, I interviewed Rich Davis, the founder and chief creative officer of ThinkSpark on how I made it marketing. And the way he did one of his lessons was let others talk first, always let them finish their thoughts. Leadership mm. can be more about listening than talking. And I know for mm. me, like when I'm in that role and I'm like pitching an idea, it's so hard to listen. You're just pitch, pitch, pitch and try to push it. And that was good for me. It's like, no, no, you got to stop. You got to really hear them. What is their objection? Do they have a good point? Or is this something they're not understanding it right? Or, you know, there's something else where like, hey, this is never going to happen. Yeah. Donor, for you, is there a specific like, communication strategy you've used to be able to, to hold the line, but, but sell that idea internally and, you know, not give up on it too soon? Sure. Sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so as a, as a, uh, extremely ADHD person, but you're talking about like letting people finish and stuff. Like I, I have this <laughs> thing where like, I have to count to four before I say anything, you know, because like, as someone's talking, like, I got it. And here's the thing. And here's our solution. Like doesn't work. You know, it's, it's, it's off-putting and maybe I've seen this problem a thousand times. I know how to solve it, but we have to just like, just let it, let it sit. Um, I don't think, I don't think ideas get sold in the room. I think you walk in the room and, and the idea is already sold or it's already dead, you know, because if you're not, if you're not collaborating with the people, the internal stakeholders, like this idea of like this, like, you know, like, pulling away the magic curtain and here's our, you know, here's our, our precious baby, you know, that's like, that's dead. That's over. You know, that's been over for 20 years, probably. Um, anywhere I've been where I was like, how do you guys sell that idea? It's like, because the clients are long for the ride the entire time. And there's, um, you know, and, and they're invested in it, you know, and it's like, if you're taking, you know, if the, if the first notes you're taking on, a, on an idea are when you unveil it, that's like, that rarely goes well, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, and when you have someone, when you have like people inside of the organization who are excited about it. And like when you, when there's a great idea, people want to build, you know, and when you have that happening, like, it's like, you know, you go into the room, that, that idea is already sold. You're good. All right. It's a, it's a carousel, John. It's a carousel. <laughs> the famous man, man. At least. <laughs> yeah, the famous man, man pitch. Okay. So, let me, how do you do this then? So I know you've talked a lot about having an advocate in the organization. I agree with you when you, when you take people along on the journey, right? It's a lot different than just telling, I know the answer. It's like, no, you've come along on the journey. You've kind of like, uh, you know, found the roadblocks. You've got over them with us. So you're bought in on it. I mean, is it the meeting before the meeting or is it, is it much more than that? Like, how do you get them involved in this creative process with you? Less formal is good, you know? Um, again, it's all just people, you know, people don't like to be sold to, um, right. People don't like to be pushed. I never want, and I, you know what? I don't want to sell an idea that way. I never want to feel like I'm pushing someone over a cliff, you know, cause then they have like plausible deniability. If it doesn't, doesn't go perfectly, you know, there's like <laughs> the finger pointing is very easy in that, in that case. Um, but I think just like, you know, how, how you would want, you know, how, how you would want to be brought along on that journey is like, you know, we don't need like a thousand meetings or whatever. It's like a quick phone call or an email or something. It's just like, you know, m- make sure you're, you're aligned and make sure that uh, people are bought in along the way and have a chance to contribute. And that's, you know, that's everything. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think one thing, Mick Labs is the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. And one thing we do is these value proposition workshops. And one thing I think where they're so effective is we bring the key executives in the room for two days and we we go through the process and we go through the questions with them and we have them answering these questions. You know, like one question, <laughs> key question being, you know, if I'm the ideal customer, why should I buy this product over any mm-hmm. other product? And let them wrestle with that decision, you know, kind of have some bumpers and some guidance. But then yep. at the end of the two days, it's what they came out with, right? And now right. we're all executing on their idea. Again, with bumpers and pushback and guidance, right? it'll get off the rails pretty quickly, right? Right, yep, um, yep. But Here, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna hold, this is, this is like my big, my big rec- recommendation for, for reading. Um, the, it's called the Design Thinking Playbook. And the, the stuff that you're talking about right now with uh, the workshops and bringing everyone together and problem solving in that way, it's like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll hold the book up to the mic so people can hear it, you know, for a second. So that's, who wrote uh, that? that's it. Uh, who wrote that? It's uh, um, uh, Michael Lurick, Patrick Link and Larry Leifler. And it's just like fantastic. You know, if like, if I could just like hand someone like one thing and tell them to go be a marketer, it's, it's, it's probably that. I love it. Okay. Well, as yeah. you mentioned, you know, I, I love this idea. I mentioned in the beginning, ideas are easy. Making is the hard part. We've talked a lot about ideas and yes, we've talked about making them too, but how do you actually make them? Yep. Yep. Ideas are cheap. I mean, how many times has this happened? You're like, you've heard friends who like have an idea for a product. You're like, Oh, that's, that's, that's pretty good actually. You know, <laughs> or yeah. You know, it's like uh, when you're a writer, people are like, Oh, here's an idea for a commercial. And like, you know, they're like usually horrible, but there's always like stuff in there. That's good. You know, everyone's got ideas, you know, it's like the, but being able to make stuff like that's, that's the thing, you know? So how does that happen? Well, you line up the right people. You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll beat the drum about talent density uh, again and again, but you need to have makers, you know, people who can actually do stuff. You know, I think, um, I'll, uh, I'll reference another Jameson project. So after that first one, he mentioned like next year, everyone's like psyched about the way we do this thing. And, um, and the next one, we, we called it like Jameson catchmates. And the insight was that roommates are stealing each other's Jameson. You know, and so we turned a bottle of Jameson into a glitter bomb. And so that when <laughs> you could put that on your shelf and if your roommate was stealing your booze, then they would be you know, covered in glitter. So, well, how do we do that? Well, our creative director, uh, Chris Schakowsky, is just like this amazing maker and he just figured it out and he made a glitter bomb out of a bottle of Jameson. And once you see that, you know, that's like, it's, it's easy to get people on board once they see <laughs> that this, uh, this bottle is, uh, exploding, um, glitter in super slow motion. Um, we did have to move offices after that because there was glitter <laughs> everywhere <laughs> forever. <laughs> so the question is when you came home to your wife covered in glitter, how did you know? We won't go there. Um, <laughs> So, I avoid it like the plague. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have we have two kids, and my wife and I agreed early on there like, there will be no glitter, as as few drums as possible, but zero glitter is coming into our home. <laughs> um, so we've talked a lot about making campaigns, but you had mentioned a friend of yours, Jens, and I didn't catch his last name, mm. and you talked about actual products he made, jerky brand, soup brand, wine brand, all of these things. And so I want to get into what about when it comes to actually making a product or make it maybe making an offer? So, I mean, for me, one thing I've found, or I've written about this before is there's that brainstorming urban legend that there are no bad ideas. I know you talked about ideas before, but, but I, I hate that there are bad ideas. And mm. if you actually want to make something, you have to be able to push through an organization, kill mm. the bad ideas and get the good idea there and get it done. Yep. So for you, I don't know if you want to talk about Jens and, and, and again, any of his last name and maybe what you learned up front from him, like, like how do you actually build a product now? I mean, we've talked about ideas, we've talked about campaigns, but an actual product. Right, right, right. Uh, Jens Hoy. So <laughs> he and I have worked on stuff before. Um, he's a really good friend. Um, and, you know, he's got that Kool-Aid man energy, you know, and that's just like the... <laughs> relentlessness, you know, it's like something that I really look for when I'm hiring people and he's He's got it in spades, you know? And so I think the two things here are there's, there's so many bad ideas. Most ideas are really bad, you know, or, or undoable or not that interesting. Um, and I think you gain a lot of credibility with partners or clients or coworkers 
when you're willing to kill your own ideas, you know? Um, and again, back to our superpower, we can always have more ideas, right? Um, so let's not spend time making something that's not good. Um, or if we are spending time making something that's not good, be that a product or a campaign or what have you, like, let's just stop, you know, like, let's like not hold ourselves. Let's, let's not, um, um, spend too much sunk cost on anything. So there's, there's definitely that. So I think the thing that Jens gets really well is, um, you know, I think his playbook is really interesting. Um, I pointed this out to him and he didn't even realize that he did it, but it's, um, you know, but it's, but it's a great playbook, you know, take like kind of down market, um, products and do the up market version of them, um, or vice versa, you know, to take like a really up market, say inaccessible product. And how does he make that, you know, accessible? So, you know, he made Crave Jerky is phenomenally successful jerky brand, you know? And like the first thing that you think about with jerky is like gas station packets of God knows what, you know? Um, and I think he really, that product transformed that category, you know? So I would say with him, it's like, Right. Great ideas plus relentlessness. And I think that's probably true, you know, see across the board and any, any good idea that's happened is like a really, I think it's probably comes from those two things. You know, if this was a Z morning zoo radio show, I would have a button that I could push every time you said the Kool-Aid man just to say, Oh yeah, just, but we don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have the sound effects. I, pro I promise not to mention him again. <laughs> again <laughs> no, but, I love it. I love it. Yeah. That is, that is an example of jumping in and getting it. And I, right, yeah. I, you know, like I've probably done that meeting too. Yeah, just I mean, I probably haven't shorthand is right. No, I, probably, I haven't done it probably mm -hmm. in that way in a meeting like the Kool Aid Man. But is that kind of idea of having to jump in and be like, "Wait a minute here"? Um, all right, we talked about a lot of lessons from the things you made. That's what we do as marketers. We get to make mm -hmm. things. We also get to make them from people. You've already mentioned a lot of people. We have some more people that uh, you learn lessons when you collaborated with. I'm going to ask you about them in just a moment. But first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. And you can get 10,000 marketing experiments working for you with a free trial of the MechLabs AI Guild at mechlabs.com slash AI. That's M-E-C-L-A abs.com slash AI to get artificial intelligence working for your marketing organization. All right. As I mentioned, uh, we collaborate with people. That's a key thing we get to do with marketers, key fun thing. And we get to work up close and see some of them. Uh, for you, one of them is the actor Michael B. Jordan. And you said from mm -hmm. him, you learned be easy to root for. So how did you learn this from Michael B. Jordan? Oh, man, he's, he's a prince. So let's see, I was working on the Adidas brand. And he was you know, one of the one of the celebs that they had pulled in. Um, and we were just and this is like, God, it was after the wire, but before he was enormous. Right. Um, and it was really interesting that like we worked with this where we had we like, you know, like back to back shoots, basically at one, sh you know, like like three days, sh three shoots, three different celebrities. The person we had shot the day before was this um, hip hop R and B artist um, who I'll, I'll say a person's name and you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't even like recognize it anymore. And that shoot was like, if you were writing a terrible TV show about what it's like to work with celebrities, it was, it was that, <laughs> you know, it was the handlers saying, you know, like, Oh, we got to get here and stuff. I'm like, dude, no one wants to be done with this more than me right now. So trust me, we'll get you out of here as soon as humanly possible. Right. So then we went into the the shoot the next day um, with Michael B. Jordan and just, I'm just like clenched up. I'm like, I can't do another, another day of that. Um, and he was just so easy to work with and he was professional and he was thoughtful and he was appreciative uh, and you know, he's already a star. He doesn't need to be, you know, he didn't have an entourage, you know, it was just like, he's just a person, you know, and, uh, again, really easy to root for, you know? So like watching his career just explode and then watching someone else's career sort of like Peter out, you know, it's like, if you're, if you're hard to work, you know, people just don't, you don't have time for it, you know, like, being hyper precious and this idea of like, I think it gets back to what we do, this like celebrity, celebrity CMO idea. I just, 
I think it's exhausting, you know, and, and I just don't think people are into it anymore. So easy to root for, uh, you know, I've got some, some good evidence from people I've worked with. That that's a, uh, that's key. I do want to mention, we're not going to release the video so no one can see it. It's only the audio. John does not have an entourage right now. Just so everyone knows. I just want to, just want to be clear I mean, about that. Half of them are in that room back there. The <laughs> I just can't see them. them. <laughs> um, so be easy to root for. I like this because I also think this is a great lesson for brands. So I want to ask mm -hmm. you, how can brands be easy to root for, right? For yeah. example, we did some research with 2,400 Americans. Half of them, we said, think about a company that you're satisfied with. Half, we said, think about a company you're unsatisfied with. Then we asked them a bunch of other questions. One of those questions was, how well do the products and services of that company do their intended job? So 49% of satisfied customers said very well, only 6% of unsatisfied customers, right? Which you would kind of expect. But in our role as marketers, to me, where that fits in is, yeah, did it do its intended job? Do we make the right promise, right? If we make the right promise in our marketing, it should do its intended job. And to mm -hmm. me, that is one way to make a brand easy to root for, right? We're not, yep. we're setting it up for success, not for failure. So I wonder yep. for you, John, that, that's my opinion. How can we make our brands easy to root for? No, that's, um, I think that's spot on, you know, and I think what you're saying gets back to that, you know, old expression that like, you know, nothing will kill a bad product faster than good advertising, you know, um, which, which holds true over and over again. Um, brands that are easy to root for are, uh, are humble, have some, have some degree of humility, you know, and I think like when a brand screws something up such a great opportunity like never miss that opportunity um if you're if your brand biffs it if you do something wrong because the way that you react to that is way more important than what you're saying like every other day you know and i think it's one of the one of the promises of the the current media landscape we live in you know around say especially social media is that immediate feedback you know and so as a brand you can raise your hand say hey we botched this and here's how we're fixing it you know, um, instead of tightly controlling the, the PR machine and trying to, uh, you know, trying to shut the whole thing down, it's like just being able to say like, oh, hey, I, I messed up, you know, and that's like a, that's a big deal for me and just like the work environment, you know, it's like just being able to say like, look, we're going to step on each other's toes. Like, all you know, it's like smart people working really quickly together on intense things, you know, people are going to mess up. and. They're going to make mistakes and they're going to say the wrong thing and being able just to say like, oh man, I really messed that up. I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to do that again. You know, it's like, it's so disarming, you know, and it's disarming for brands, it's disarming for people. And it's, I think something that, um, you know, certainly helped me once I, I realized that and, and took that to heart. Yeah, you know, I think another element of it is is being on brand, so to speak, like if a brand is setting up a certain promise, and they're not, you know, some brands can get away with certain things, because they haven't made a promise that other brands can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for example, what some of Google's products do is kind of funny to me, because it seems to go against what Google says it it, it is for. Um, with that, before we, we leave the kind of celebrity portion of our interview here, I just want to bring up William Shatner, because you mentioned him as well. And it seemed <laughs> like your experience with him... While it wasn't the same as Michael B. Jordan's, it was on brand because who you saw publicly was who you saw privately. Oh man, this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I got to work with him a few times. Um, and that's who he is, man. Like that's <laughs> which is great, you know. It's if someone is not who they are in the you know public persona, that's really disappointing. But um you know, to be to be abused by William Shatner was kind of a, a rite of passage at one of the agencies <laughs> that I worked on. I, I, we were shooting a commercial one time. I love this. And like the you know director and I were sort of like laughing about just like his whole thing, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, we asked him to redo a line a certain way. And, uh, you know, he just wasn't he wasn't into it and asked again. He's like. All right, I'll do it. You're fucking it up, though. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> you're sorry. I wasn't supposed to swear on your podcast. You're screwing it up, and you just like I'm like okay, thanks. But like, man, it was so fun to get sworn at by William Shatner. You know, like what a treat. <laughs> Well, there goes the virtual swear jar. So I was going to mention when you were talking about the uh, the monkey that sweared online, I, I wanted to get you to say a few of those uh, swear words just to uh, 
get your PR up to uh, to get concerned, but I didn't. But uh, but we got that thir- thirty seven minutes, and we got the swear word in. So it's right. Great. I think that was pretty good. I think yeah, for sure. Uh, I think uh, Kate's going to be happy that you know you can beep that out if you need to. But um, I think overall, with uh, my my normal potty mouth, I think we've uh, I think we've done pretty well so far. It's fine. You got to be who you are. We'll just let Apple know it's explicit. Um, so with a lot of the things we talked about, it can be easy to be gun shy to actually jump in and, and do some of these things because, you know, oh my God, like what if it doesn't perform? Like there's so much to go through. One of your key lessons, which I love is make a decision. We could add an expletive between A and decision. I would think make a decision, but we won't. Um, mm-hmm. And you learned this from Andrew Robinson, head of BBDO. I think this is so true. How did you learn this from Andrew and, and how do you live it in your life? It's it's so hard to make these decisions sometimes. It is. It is. And the other thing is it's so easy to not do stuff. You yeah. know, I think when you're in a, you know, when you're working, if you're inside of a big organization, it can be really difficult to to get stuff made because it's so much easier to not do anything, right? And not not say yes, you know. Um yeah. The one of the smarter things that I did was when I first became um, a creative director. Is I, cause just, you know, no one trains anyone in advertising. So um, yeah. <laughs> I, I emailed like everyone who I thought was a, a good leader or a good boss of mine or, you know, what have you. Um, and um, Andrew Robertson, who was, you know, Supreme Overlord of BBDO, um, had mentioned one of my projects in, uh, in a talk that he did. So I kind of felt like maybe he owed me one, you know, so I reached out to him. And he got right back to me. It was super cool. Um, and that was this thing is like, make a decision and see it all the way through. And if that decision is the right one, then all the better. But it's much better to have made a choice and execute against it than to keep tacking and, and try something different and, um, and, and not see it all the way through. So, you know, I really took that to heart. I think it's 100% accurate. Um, you know, and I, and I think it just gets back to like brands that can't afford to be boring, do bold things. I like to reframe this idea of risk um, for everyone I work with in marketing. It's like, oh, well, that's a really risky idea. It's like, well, it's not. If it's risky, we shouldn't do it. You know, but what's really risky in marketing is invisibility. If you're going to spend whatever money you're going to spend, and no one's going to notice because whatever you've made is totally innocuous, then you're doing it wrong. You know, like that, I call that like creative malpractice, you know? So the, the real, the real risk is that no one will notice outside of that. It's like, what's really the huge downside, you know, like if people don't like something, they're not going to pay attention to it, or you're going to get some angry letters, like big deal, you know? Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, um, making sure that brands are not invisible, right? Obviously it's, that's, that's what we do. And you know, that, that comes from, all right, let's, let's say yes, you know, let's say yes to something and then let's make it happen and let's take it all the way. Well, here's, and this may be just less of a conversation, a uh, question than an observation. See what you think. But uh, here's where I also make a decision really comes in for me. Like a lot of times we're trying. So when you, any marketing campaign you're doing, any message you're doing, there's an other human being who is different from you. We call them a customer, but they're just a human being. We're trying to figure them out and try to put something out in the world that will serve them, get their attention, whatever, right? And so we can debate this a lot internally. We can do these focus groups and surveys and stuff. But until you get that out in the world, you don't really have that feedback and data to see what works and what doesn't. And when we, so when we refuse to make a decision, when we just keep it internal, and we keep dragging our feet, like you said, we don't do something, like we're not getting that feedback. So I would mm-hmm. say, that's why to me, make a decision is so valuable. Like, yes, even if it doesn't go to plan, <laughs> even if it, if it goes right. off track a little, let's right. learn something from it because it actually right. went out there. And then what can we do based on that new knowledge? Right. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, that's, um, that's a big thing for me too, is like, um, you know, I think empathy based marketing, you know, it's like customer focused. Now we have customer obsessed, you know, cause we need, we need like a more extreme version of that. It's like, you just talk to people, you know, and you find out what you can find out, you know, if you've got an idea and it seems really bold, then the reason why it seems really bold is it should be really insightful and it should be something that your target is going to resonate with. Um, and there's one way to make that happen. And it's like, you know, I've heard that in other episodes, of your podcast as well is like, you just go out and talk to people, you know, and, um, 
then have some empathy and see what their day is like, you know, and, and see what the, the role of your product or your brand, like, what can you do for them? What's their, what is their problem? What's the task to be completed? You know, what could we do? And if we know that, if we know our customer well enough, then, you know, we could, we could roll big dice, you know, we can do really bold things so long as we know that it's going to resonate with our customer. But like you're saying, what's like the, you know, what's the most you can know, right? Is maybe like 60%, right? Maybe 70 if you're a brilliant genius. And so, yeah, then you just need to get, you need to get feedback from the market, you know? And that's like people who are looking at your marketing or if that's people who are using your product, you know, it's just like that feedback loop. I think we're really lucky right now inside of, inside of marketing, whereas we got, we get these uh, customer feedback loops that are that really obvious that we can, we can tap into and we're <laughs> foolish if we don't do that. Yeah. And I'm glad you bring up customer focus, customer obsessed, because there's a specific term that, that I like to use and we used as an organization, which is customer first. Right. Mm. And specifically because like, yeah, we're all kind of obsessed with the customer, all focused on them. But the difference with customer first is it kind of forces you to make a decision. And so that like that research I shared before, um, that was part of a bigger uh, survey we did with 2400 Americans to figure out customer first marketing. And what we found was, which goes a line in line with your be easy to root for uh, lesson when it wasn't like if, if companies made mistakes or this or that, or they didn't do something right. It was if customers felt like the company had their best interests at heart, like if they did, sure. then yeah. Like if, if a mistake happens, they're a little more forgiving and you know what I mean? They're, they're more likely uh -huh. to recommend them more likely yeah, to do it yeah. again. But if they felt that the customer didn't have their best, the company didn't have their best interests at heart, then man, they were pretty, <laughs> you know, right, right. an MVP, a minimum viable product wasn't enough. You need a minimum awesome product, you know? And right. so I think that comes down to then for us, like what customer first means, it just forces us to make a decision because there's a lot of easy decisions for the customer and easy decisions for the brand. But there are some of those 50, 50 jump balls. And when there are, we should say what's in the best interest of the customer instead of the brand. Uh huh. That's exactly it. You know, I, I wish the microphone would pick up how vigorously I'm nodding right now, but um, <laughs> I think cu customer first is, is actually the best way of, uh, of expressing that thought hundred percent. I'll be using that moving forward. And it's, it's the best yardstick for, should we do this thing? You know? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you see this all the time in product design where you can tell it was like engineers like, Oh, we can do this. That'll be cool. You know, it's like, well, why, you know, and, you know, being taking that customer first approach, that'll really tell you what you need to do. And maybe more importantly, what you don't need to do. Yeah. And sometimes when, Hey, you just got to eat it as a company in the short term to, to, and it, it will pay off in ways you don't understand customer right. lifetime value yep. and all these other things. Yep. yep. And you know what else? I mean, you, you said, um, the, your customers, uh, uh, they'll love your brand if they feel like that you have their best interests at heart. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a big thing for working with clients and other internal stakeholders. Like for me, you know, one of the keys to success is like once once we build the love and trust, you know, we have a much, it's much easier to work together. It's like, well, how do we build the love and trust? Well, that comes from them knowing that I have their best interests at heart, right? So I'm really invested in their brand in general, and I'm really invested in them um, specifically, right? So I want the brand to be wildly successful, whatever that looks like, that's what I'm going to do. and. I love working with great people and I want to do it over and over again. So, you know, my clients know, and you know, I, my coworkers know that it's like, I just want what's best for them and best for what we're doing. And there it's like, it's much easier um, to do great things when everyone knows that you are fully invested in, in, um, um, in them and, and what we're doing. Yeah. And I like how you did said not only clients, but coworkers. So let's talk sure. about that element of being a marketer, marketing leadership, our employees, our team. Uh, one lesson you said, marketing is not going anywhere. And you learned this from mm -hmm. Rob Rich, the creative director of Publicist Seattle. Tell us yeah. how you learned this about Rob. Yeah. yeah, from yeah. Rob. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good one. And I've kept that close to my heart forever. So let's see. 
we were talking about starting a family, um, not he and I together, but yeah, <laughs> doing that. Um, he's like, Oh, Johnny, you, you never, you never ready. You never ready. You just, you just got to jump in and do it. You know? And I think that's true for so many, that was my terrible Boston accent. So <laughs> that's true for so, you know, so many things like you just got to jump in and do it. Um, and then on the, you know, on that's like, we were talking about more like personal life stuff, you know, I, I missed someone's wedding early in my career because I was working on this like radio script project. And it's just like, I just, you know, like I want to die inside when I, re- you know, realize you want to do And like, you know, like maybe they would have fired me for that. And if they did, maybe that would have been good. You know, yeah. it's like the times where I've missed out on life stuff because of marketing. It's like, oh, God, I never I never look back at that and feel like I did. I did the right thing, you know. And so I think marketing's not going anywhere. It translates into you know, a, a few things for me. It's like one, just like relax a little bit, you know, and and play loose. Right. I mean, I think in any anything, you know, music or sports, getting into some kind of flow state, anytime that you're using your brain to make your money, uh, staying loose is like, it's always, it's always better. The other thing I think that were that's super applicable is, um, you know, how, how I work with people who, who work for me, you know, and I'm a big proponent of talent density being incredibly, you know, maybe the most important thing. You know, so hire great people. I want to keep working with them. And so I want to make sure what we're doing works for them in the long term, you know? And so if you're like, uh, you know, if if you're engaged in this like sweatshop mentality and so, you know, you lose people because they have families, they have stuff to do, they burn out, you know? And so, you know, go see a movie sometimes, just relax, you know, like let's, you know, tell everyone we need an extra day on this because someone just needs to think about something more or just needed to go get some perspective, you know? So man, don't miss out on life stuff because of marketing. That's silly. And, and I wish I didn't have to say that, but you know, I think a lot of people are passionate about what we do, you know? And so it's, uh, you know, that's uh, so it comes up a lot, you know, and, and work at a pace that you can work at for a long time. You know, not all just sprinting all the time and burning out. Yeah. So, and I think marketing is not going anywhere as a term to like, you know, Hey, if someone's got life going on, marketing is going to be here when you get back. I like that, right. but yep. I wonder, are there any specific things that you do either for yourself or your team to kind of model behavior so they know that they can do certain things to make sure they don't burn out? You know, for for example, I interviewed Tara Robertson, the CMO of Bitly on how I made it marketing. And one lesson she shared was never be afraid to ask for help, right? And this isn't shocking. We've heard it before. But hearing that from a senior leader and hearing her specific story, how early in her career in SaaS, she was at an event. You know, she found someone who she really, you know, kind of liked with how they were presenting. She was brave enough to go up to them, ask for help and say, hey, can you help me figure out this crazy SaaS world? I'm pretty new to it. And then they became kind of close industry friends for a long time. I think mm-hmm. seeing that, you know, modeling that for your team, it's like, OK, like I can ask for help. Right. Sometimes yep. we say these words to teams because we think as leaders, we should say these words. But unless we really model these behaviors, I don't know that our team really believes them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for you, is there any way you found to be able to model that to make sure you don't burn out, your team doesn't burn out? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the person you're talking about is like, there's humility, right? Which makes them easy to root for. Right. And so that's, you know, that's a, that's a key to success for sure. Let's see. There's, um, the, uh, a lot of the times we're, we're smart people and we're all passionate about what we do. And um, we think the world expects us to have the, the, the answer on the spot, you know, and being able to say, I don't know, let me think about it. So I think you know, early in my career, I was terrified of, of saying that. Like, I have to have the right answer all the time. But actually, you're so much more credible and you're saying like, I I don't know. And, you know, if I don't know, I'm not going to try to make it up. You know, I think anytime that uh, you know, I'm around a team, you know, working with other people and just being able to, um, um, you know, bow to their expertise and say, all right, well, you're brilliant. This is why I hired you. Tell me what to do. You know, I think that's uh, 
you know, that, that certainly helps. The other thing is there's a few little things. Um, when people are taking time off or if people are, you know, out of office for some reason, you know, I, at first they'll always write me like, Hey, I've got this doctor's appointment and I have this thing that needs to get lanced. And I'm like, Oh, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't you know. <laughs> never tell me, you know, don't explain why you're not going to be in the office. Just say, I'm out for this hour. I'll see you after that. Here's why. There's a lot of people with not great boundaries, right? And if you tell them why you're not going to be out, then they'll start having a discussion about it, you know? And I don't ever want people to feel like they need to justify while they're, why they need to be out, you know? Also, like, if they're interviewing or something like i don't want to be lied to you know yeah. so you're, just, you're out you're not out you know that's, that's it and you know that and that's also like very very protective of people's time off because it's really important you know and there's been times in my career where i was like i'm taking a week off but i'm you know i'm looking at my email and stuff like three times a day it's like i'm not recharging you know like the 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 company is not getting out, out of my time off what they need to get out of my time off because I'm not getting out of my time off. So when someone's on vacation, like I will hold that line for them. It's like, do not talk to this person. We want them to come back refreshed and feel like, again, we have their best interests at heart. So, John, we've talked about many different things that it takes to be a marketer. If you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? I don't know. <laughs> Here's what I, that's perfect. For me. You just modeled what you said. When you don't know something, don't know. So right. we'll, we'll, we'll meet back in a week and then you follow up with me and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to know next week either. Here's what I know though. I know, I know it works for me. Um, and that is um, curiosity and empathy. So empathy works really well when you're leading people and it works really well when you're marketing to people. It's actually critical for both of those things. And then one of the, if I could only ask one question um, when I'm interviewing someone, it would be, what's the last thing that you taught yourself? Or what is the last thing that you learned? That's probably the most predictive question that I ask in an interview. Um, and when people have a lot of answers to that, then, you know, typically they're a really interesting and interested person. And I think that's a, a really key to the kind of personality that succeeds in marketing. So I'll say, I'll say curiosity and empathy are certainly the things that have worked for me. Well, John, you are clearly a very interesting person, and I was very interested in this conversation. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Dan. I've had a really good time. Appreciate you having me on. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.